Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast. Uh, I'm Steve. I'm Marty. I'm Don. I'm Fish. And this is the Growing with Fishes podcast. Um, we uh, have both of our co-hosts today, and uh, we're uh, also. <laughs> oh wait, hold on. Got the feedback there. All right, sorry about that. I always forget that that starts in the beginning. Anyways, um, we are joined today uh, by um, Donald Bailey. He is uh, one of the uh, longtime experts at UVI. He's been there pretty much since the beginning. In fact, I think you were there since the beginning, correct? I missed the beginning by about five years. Okay. But uh, he's definitely one of the uh, the longest running uh, researchers at uh, UVI. Um, for those of you who don't know, they founded the uh, the commercial aquaponics model, um, or the generally accepted commercial aquaponics model that's out there. Um, and it's a, a big honor to have him on the show today. Um, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. Um, so why don't you tell us about uh, you know how you got. Uh, started uh, at UVI and then um, you know some of the or a little bit of history about that and then um, you know kind of how uh, you guys have come to be uh, what you guys are today okay <clears throat> well it did start in uh, 1979 when Jim Mercosi came to the agriculture experiment station at UVI and um, I came here in 1986 so the problems that uh, Virgin Islands farmers have are lack of arable land, you know, good agricultural land to grow crops on, and also um, a kind of an irregular and rainfall pattern that's pretty seasonal. So there's no good surface water of um, rivers to pull irrigation water out of. Uh, the wells are pretty salty. You can't rely on rainfall. And so those are so land and water issues. Uh, given the problem that uh, uh, Dr. Rokosi was given was like, how do, how do you solve those problems? Uh, and his concept was to do you know, aquaculture, in, integrate uh, fish production with uh, vegetable production in the hydroponic system. And uh, so that's the beginning of uh, how, how that all developed. The idea of aquaponics, of course, had existed before that and his research had been using water hyacinths to clean water uh, from fish production. So um, moving f from just water hyacinths is a plant that would get discarded to a vegetable crop that has economic value, I think was another uh, key thing that uh, we developed here. Instead of just mitigating uh, wastewater, we're getting a fish crop and a vegetable crop out of the same system. And I guess a, a third uh, point was reduction of waste discharge into the environment. Because if you're just going to do a straight aquaculture system, uh, recirculating aquaculture, you're going to have wastewater that gets discharged and that goes into uh, receiving streams or you might have to send it to a municipal sewage system for treatment and that's going to be a cost. So if you can reduce the amount of waste that you're needing to discharge into the environment, uh, that's also a bonus. So those are pretty much the three uh, guiding principles between behind our work was um, intensification of production in a small area of land, uh, really conservative use of water, and minimal discharge into the environment. So um, well, they did start with media beds. Uh, we were using gravel uh, from the local quarry and found that that was um, had a number of different problems uh, when you go with media beds. So <clears throat> even by the time I arrived here in 86, they had already done their first experiment where they removed the gravel media from one uh, set of uh, research systems and we're just doing the floating styrofoam rafts. And so we've always done um, since 86, 86, we've been doing uh, floating deep water culture uh, on rafts uh, production. So with the deep water culture, just to jump in real quick, are you guys using, um, what are you doing for solids filtration? We have uh, passive solids removal. We have a clarifier, uh, takes out 
by just by um, residence time in that tank, the solids uh, settle out of the water. And but because that's pretty inefficient, uh, we then we have net tanks that trap the remaining part of the solids. So using orchard netting that would cover trees uh, for bird birds preying on um, you know fruit trees, uh, we trap the rest of the solids in that net tank. Okay. So they're both uh, pretty inefficient methods to do it. Um, there are, but they're cheap. They can, uh, you know, a couple thousand, our, you know, our system is big. So I think our, our main clarifier tank is probably a thousand dollars and the net tanks might be a couple hundred each. So you've put that cost in up front. It's very, it's actually a small part of the whole system cost, but there is uh, labor ongoing uh, to keep those, uh, clean there's removing solids from the clarifier is pretty simple but then about an hour each week to clean the net tanks out hmm. so there there are technology uh, the drum filters that can be used to take out uh, all the solids in a system but they're a lot more expensive so it's a trade-off so not as much a fan of uh, like radial flow filters or uh, slow swirl filters as much as just uh, clarifiers where they settle. We have a we've we've used the um, swirl filters, the, the slow ones, and they they're as efficient as the clarifier is. Okay, right on. Yeah, there's we've did a publication on that a few years ago where we compared them. The settling tanks were uh, about the same at solids removal. I uh, have not used a radial flow filter. Yeah, I just wanted to see uh, if there was a reason that you had a preference of one over the other, but good stuff. We had a question from Chad on what what's the total size of the system or each system that you, you guys run there? Well, our big system that we consider our commercial uh, scale system is 30,000 gallons of water. Um, the fish rearing tanks, would be about uh, 9,000 gallons of water. And then the rest of the water is out in the um, hydroponic tanks. And that is it's 214 square meters. I forget how that turns out into square feet. It's um, 72 rafts that are eight by four feet. So if you can do the multiplication real quick, you find out uh, the square footage of that but it comes up to 214 square meters. Nice. Our, produ our production is um, about 10,000 pounds of tilapia every year. And if we're just growing uh, lettuce in our cool season, uh, when lettuce production is the greatest, you get um, 35 to 40 cases of lettuce every week uh, during our prime lettuce season, which is we don't we can't grow lettuce all year round because of the heat but um from yeah. november, november to march we can grow that much lettuce what kind of uh warm weather leafy greens do you guys grow down there well when it gets warm uh, we go to cucumbers okra um, those are a couple crops that grow well in any temperature uh, squash does all right but all the leafy greens kind of uh drop out. I guess we we grow basil in the summertime, uh, Genovese basil. But as far as, you know, uh, kale and collards, pak choy, those are some of our regular winter crops that uh, they really decrease in uh, production in the warm temperatures. And we're really just talking about five degrees difference in water temperatures, but you can really see a difference. Yeah, it definitely does make a big difference when it comes to uh, yeah. the oxygenation and the root development when it, looking at the water temperature. So mm -hmm. I totally get that. Yeah. What is um, what kind of uh, testing have you guys done with silica um, in relation to aquaponics? Uh, we have not looked at that as a nutrient. I know you're a fan of supplementing new, uh, silica. Yeah, I was kind of curious. Yeah, have not isolated that, and it doesn't. Uh, we do get our water quality tested um, about every week, especially when we're doing a trial. And it's really not even a standard 
um, element that's tested for by our lab. So um, it'd be something to look into. What, what form would you add silica? Um, so and, uh, replace your potassium. Are you guys using potassium hydroxide or carbonate for your pH up? Yeah, potassium hydroxide. Okay, so you'd replace your potassium hydroxide with potassium silicate. Um, okay. Just until you got it up to the level you wanted, and then you can go back to you know alternating it occasionally with your um, uh, you know normal potassium supplement. And what is the level we want it? Um, so for vegetable growing, um, we found that it's best to keep it above 60 parts per million. Um, you can go as low as 55 parts per million for lettuce, um, but it helps a lot, especially in northern climates where you get a little bit of cold and you get the the, the fungus in the uh, in the lettuces. And then it also helps a lot, especially with cucumbers, zucchini, squash, um, pumpkins, all those that tend to get powdery mildew really bad by the end of the season just kind of automatically because of the humidity. Um, it really makes a large difference for those. Also with cannabis as well, we found. But uh, especially in the zucchini and cucumber and squash, it really makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, disease prevention. Yeah, it helps the, the plant's immune system. It helps a lot with plant stress. It also mm. helps the plants with the heat stress quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will probably look at that sometime. But um, so back to our system, maybe just to walk our way through it. We've sure. got our four fish rearing tanks that uh, we do staggered stocking. So at six week intervals, we stock a rearing tank with uh, 650 gram fish and we allow them to grow for 24 weeks and before the harvest comes. So at week uh, zero, you stock, then week six, 12, 18, and in week 24, you come back to your first tank and harvest and immediately restock them. And so doing that uh, production system, we um, have a little bit, uh, you have about eight to nine harvests every year, depending on how they fall in the calendar. And um, each harvest, you have 600 fish growing up to two pounds each. So you're around, uh, 1,000, 1,200 pounds, depending on your survival and how uniformly they grew. So we say 1,000 pounds. And um, so that eight to nine times a year is where we're coming up with our, so 10,000 pounds is probably your good number for pounds of fish that you're producing. And this is tilapia in the tropics and we're in an outdoor environment. So uh, your numbers will vary depending on your water temperatures because they do slow down uh, in production when the water gets cold. So the, the fish are fed a manufactured diet of uh, Purina Aquamax. We, we import that. It's 32% protein. And we're <clears throat> trying to grow the fish as fast as we can. So we need to give them the highest quality food. If you feed them a low quality food, that's gonna slow down their growth rate. They're not gonna get to that two pound size in 24 weeks. And so either you'll reduce the amount of production you have. But alternative feed is an area that we're looking at right now. Uh, a lot of people want to know if we can, if you can grow duckweed and feed that back to the fish. So we're, uh, we do research in duckweed right now. A student worker is, is on that. And it's probably true that you can grow the duckweed off of the waste that you collect from the system. Um, how much you can produce and whether it slows down the growth rate enough that, uh, you know, you're going to substitute out some of that food uh, that you're importing and feeding it the duck, feeding the fish the duckweed. So there's going to be a trade off and there'll be some break even point that you can uh, determine at what point is it worthwhile growing duckweed to feed, um, feed the fish. So the, the fish have eaten, uh, they're going to the bathroom. The solid waste is getting removed from the system in the clarifier and the net tanks, which we already discussed a little bit. You don't wanna have any of that solid waste going out into the hydroponic tanks because it clogs up on the plant roots in the first section of the trough. And um, if it does settle out in the bottom of the hydroponic troughs, then of course it's just going to de decay 
be a secondary source of ammonia and be another water quality factor that you have to manage. So getting all the solids out before the hydroponic tanks is really uh, critical. And then our hydroponic beds are um, four feet wide and 100 feet long and the water, they're in pairs. Uh, so the water's traveling down and back and into the sump. And when you look at our pictures of our system, you do see these three pairs of hydroponic tanks. That's an artifact of how we developed our technology. We had two smaller systems uh, for a couple years. We wanted to modify the design of the fish production side. So we um, took out the rearing tanks and then we, and we combined uh, those pairs of hydroponic tanks. So uh, there's, Definitely, if I were going to start from scratch, I would make uh, just two, one pair of two hydroponic tanks. They'd be wider and longer and have the same growing area as what we have, but you'd save on uh, some space. So the water then returns from the hydroponic tanks and into the sump. We have a um, one half horsepower circulating pump down there and the water gets pumped up to the rearing tank and off it goes again. It takes about um, five hours for the water to cycle through from the sump uh, through the rearing tanks and other components and then back to the sump. So that's a quick walkthrough. Have you done any uh, experimentation with black soldier flies or with um, changing the food source as far as uh, minerals? Uh, we have grown black soldier flies. Uh, another good possibility. Uh, we don't currently process any of our fish, so uh, we didn't have that many fish carcasses to deal with, but I like the idea uh, if you have, were having a processing plant to feed them your uh, fish carcasses. Definitely a good way to get rid of them. But sourcing all of that material for black soldier flies is, I think, the limiting factor. If I were to go around the island and go to restaurants and ask for all the plate scrapings from them, that becomes too, too uh, costly in terms of my time and effort. So I would really want to have that waste uh, stream to be on site and um, be able to grow my black soldier flies with something that I'm producing myself instead of sourcing it from other uh, facilities. What um what surprises have you come across? Um, you know, in your different testing and different things you guys have experimented with. Hmm. Well, I'd say you know the one big drawback of our our system is actually the energy use uh, because we've intensified. You know, we're required to aerate the fish tanks, uh, keep all those water quality parameters at their highest level. And we, to do all that, we use a lot of energy. So it's really, a, I think our, the problem we need to address is how, is like what is the trade-off when you start reducing the amount of aeration uh, into the tanks? And uh, especially, I would cut air to the hydroponic troughs uh, and see how that impacts the uh, plant growth. But that's, uh, I think that's a big constraint for, for us right now is, is the energy use. Did you have a question, Marty? Yeah. Oh. Um, what, uh, oh, yeah, well, I was just wondering, I mean, you were, you were talking about energy use sort of being the constraint and the oxygen um, you, know, you are, you know, are you thinking about experimenting with it or you have, I think my internet skipped out for a second. Uh, I think you said you were either we're, thinking about or were, were, uh, had already started experimenting with cutting off your oxygen blowing into the tank. Is that? Is that uh, we're, yep. We're, we're more thinking about it than doing it right now. Hopefully we'll be doing it let's say by May, <clears throat> last fall, I, uh, because we have those three pairs of hydroponic tanks, I do have some options and uh, playing around with that. So I cut off all the air to one set of hydroponic troughs and I reduced the air to 
another pair by half and left the uh, other pair, you know, operating normally. And there were definitely um, differences. The, the system with no air at any time of the day, uh, 24 hours off, you know, definitely uh, have a much smaller plants. So um, my idea is actually just to turn off the aeration at night. And uh, that's kind of couples with uh, going off grid. I, if, I, if I'm able to reduce the amount of aeration I need overnight, then I, need, I wouldn't need less battery uh, backup uh, to, uh, to, to run my system. Uh, over, right, have you considered um, like maybe draining those tanks? Um, I know maybe in your system you can't, can't do it right now, but uh, one of the things that I've done before is shut down some of my systems for a period of time um, and just made sure that the, the tanks were empty as opposed to full so you weren't, um, you weren't doing that. So I don't know if you guys have thought about uh, doing that, but I, I definitely have considered that as well for myself just in terms of power usage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, even shutting down the system all, you know, all together for certain lengths of time um, or using timers as opposed to, like right now I use siphon systems so that, you know, that it's constantly running and, you know, it, it helps give the, the roots exposure to air without pulling it from the water. Right. Um, but I, I've, uh, I've been wanting and I haven't, I haven't done it yet, but basically combine the two where you would have, you know, be able to drain the, um, be able to drain the raft beds and still have the the roots suspended in the dark. Um, yep. So. We yeah we would definitely have to re-engineer the system uh, to do that. Yeah, I was thinking you probably have to lift it up in the air. Yeah. Probably sits too low for that now. We've got a lot of water in those tanks, and to dr to drain them out, you need to have a a sump somewhere on the side to to hold that uh, quantity of water. So that'd be our that'd be our constraint, and and yeah, there's a, there's different ways to engineer around a problem, and that might be a solution. But if you're in like a if you're in a greenhouse uh, where you're already constrained by space and available land, um, you know you have to think about where you'd put that water when you drain it out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So right now in my system, we're growing um, two kinds of lettuce, uh, a pak choy and um, kale, two kinds of basil, uh, the green Genovese and a red one uh, called red Reuben. I've got some sunflowers in right now for the cut flower uh, business. Um, I've got some tomatoes really for the first time in a long time. I really shy away from fruiting crops. I like crops that, the vegetable crops especially, that are leafy, leafy greens that are in and out uh, within a three to four week time period. Just gives you good cash flow. You've got, uh, you stagger the production so that you're only harvesting a third of your system uh, every week. And so you've got uh, constantly have a product to take to the market. Your buyers are expecting something every week. It's not like you're telling them, well, I can bring it to you the first of the month, you know, every four weeks, and you're going to have a bunch of it uh, if, you have, if you plan on harvesting the whole system just once a month. So um, staggering your production, uh, I like for cash flow. These tomatoes that I put in there, they were uh, seeded in early, let's say, mid-December. Right now I've got a lot of fruit on the plant, but I don't have not, nothing red, nothing ready to pick yet. And here we are at the beginning of March. So that's um, one, two, two and a half months that I haven't uh, produced anything from them yet. And in that same period of time, I could have had three harvests of lettuce from that area. And I've got this envision a raft that's four by eight feet with um, 60 heads of lettuce on them at a dollar each. So that's $180 worth of lettuce that I could have produced in that time period. And I still don't have any, even $1 from the tomatoes. And I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to produce $180 worth of tomatoes, uh, let's say over the next month. 
So <clears throat> that's why I, I really like the leafy green uh, for you know good cash flow for an uh, aquaponic farmer. Um, it's always yeah, fun. It's it's all, yeah, it's always fun to grow fruiting crops, and your customers are going to be interested in buying other products from you too. But uh, don't commit a large portion of your farm to uh, those crops. You know, you really, I mean, it's it's all about cash flow. You're paying your workers every day. You're you're paying your electric bill. Um, those are you know your daily costs, and you at the end of the month you need to be able to pay them with the product that you've uh, produced and sold. Yep, and it also it also depends too on uh, what kind of um, uh, what kind of supplementation or what you know other uh, things you're doing, or if you're growing something like uh, cannabis, which most of us do, where you're able to get a nice big cash crop every two or three uh, uh, months, you know. Mm -hmm. It definitely depends on the crop. Yeah, I think it also still some kind of suffers from that same thing where, you know, pretty much no matter what, I mean, I guess maybe the exception being clones, um, you know, you're, you're still pretty much limited to being, uh, you know, a, a cash crop every few months as opposed to having a certain portion of it. Now, you can stagger it as well. I know a lot of people do so that you're only harvesting a, a third at a time and be able to do that, but I think the the nice thing about uh, greens like you're talking about is that they, they just go so fast from from seed to harvest um, w without a lot of prep time or veg time or um, you know needing a separate facility to get them going or you know anything like that. So it definitely still still suffers a little bit from that uh, complexity as opposed to just you know the simple fact of you know uh, throwing some seeds out and you know, letting them grow for three weeks and then taking them to the market is, you know, um, it's pretty simple. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned uh, supplements. Some of the fruiting crops, you need to full your spray to make sure that they've got balanced nutrients. Um, the calcium on my squash is a pretty common one because they get blossom end rot. And uh, the tomatoes, they might need more potassium in the uh, mix because the the water has so much nitrogen in it that they have got a lot of um, foliage growing. They don't have that much fruiting. So in order to get them to, to, to fruit, you need to add um, phosphorus. So there's a lot, there's more management uh, required if you're doing a fruiting crop than just the uh, straight veg, uh, leafy greens. Right, and then indoors, you would also have to, you know, worry about, um, you know, pollination and all that stuff if you're doing like cucumbers or tomatoes or, yes, uh, right, anything like that. So, it definitely, just just makes it more complex. But uh, you know, you probably do still need. I think probably need a certain amount of it, um, you know, just for the the show value and the, you know, like you mentioned, other people are gonna or the same people are gonna want to buy other products from you. So, right, it definitely makes sense. Mm-hmm. Is the mic working? I've been having a little technical difficulty over here. <laughs> I can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, I'm like, why is everyone ignoring me? This is really, really not cool. <laughs> we just uh, don't like you, really. We muted yeah. you, turned you off. Man, you're just like my mom. Um, always ignoring me. Put me to the side. Anyways, um, but I was going to say, it's good uh, for foliar anyways, just as a regular IPM, I find. Um, so when it comes to supplementing uh, with foliar sprays, there's, it's uh, just a really good way to help boost production on any plant, be it veggie or um, medical, I've noticed. Yeah, like, it really helps out with all my uh, leafy greens and everything. I've noticed um, my kale's gotten a lot better tasting and just everything's really stepped up. The thing, a lot, of people, the thing a lot of people do wrong is that they'll spray right before the plant goes to sleep when the lights go off. Um, and the, actually that's when the stomata are at their smallest diameter. You really want to spray about an hour after the lights come on when the stomata are at their largest diameter so you can get the largest molecule up into that plant. Yeah, but I think their mentality with that is also things like um, Azimax or neem oils or other oily products. You're going to give your plants a little bit of a sunburn, so they might be well, trying to avoid that. Unless you're using, say, uh, optic foliar, which I've noticed I can spray those things and not really have uh, an issue with any burn well you also have better luck with a fogger than you will with an actual like 
water sprayers as well. But yeah, I know you can get a little bit of burn, which can look a little bit like spider mite damage, but it can be you're still gonna get a better res input result if you do it then. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. Lights, that. Yeah. So with the LEDs, they're they're a little softer. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Especially when you're comparing the LED you're talking about to say a 1,000 watt high pressure sodium. Oh yeah, for indoor especially, yeah, that might be more of an issue, but still. Yeah, I mean that's I mean just in general that is melting the outside of the plant to start with, so <laughs> throwing water on top is not probably not the best idea. Yeah, I would have to agree with you on that. But for the LEDs here, I do it fine as long as it's just water. I do avoid oil spray, but that's about it. And I do lift them up in the air, so anytime I spray anything, I lift them up so they're you know they're a good you know probably three feet above the canopy. And when you say you lift them, oh, you're talking about the lights, okay? I was like, you're lifting yeah. the plants. Let's just take them towards the light, Marty. No, no, wouldn't do that. Yeah, so my lights are, you know, I can just pull them up on the, I have an adjustable thing, so just lift them up pretty easy. Nice. And, uh, and um, you mentioned sources of silica earlier, and uh, one of the things that I do is I ferment um, horsetail fern, which I can harvest here locally, just about any stream, and, uh, and I ferment it and, uh, and then use it as a foiler spray. It works great for adding silica and um, treats mold and all kinds of good stuff in that. Yeah. So I don't know. I know horsetail fer fern is pretty common. There's a lot of different kinds of it. So, um, but it's a pretty interesting plant and it's a great source of those sort of trace minerals. So I do that as a foiler quite a bit. You just have to be a little bit careful. If you dose real large amounts of horsetail fern, it can lock out the vitamin B availability in your plants. So you can do it, but you don't want to do it every single week. And as far as making your own teas, you get a lot of variability in the quality of the tea that you've produced. You know, you don't, you're not making a uniform batch every time. And so yep. it's hard to replicate over time. And then it's also hard to, to tell other people how to do it and have them replicate it the, the same way as well. So, you know, yeah, you know, that's like when you buy something in a bottle from a company, uh, you know, the, the, you're pretty much guaranteed analysis, but you don't know what you're getting when you're making your own teas all the time. That's true. It's, you know, so, it's far less of an exact science in, in terms of that, uh, you know, so, yeah. but so the trade-off is you can, you can harvest it locally and it doesn't, yeah. doesn't really cost you anything. Right. I'm just thinking in terms of the industry, you know, and building that out beyond uh, personal scale and ho hobby scale stuff, you know, to, to actually commercialize these ideas, you know, you need to have uniformity. I've done a lot of experimenting with the potassium silicate, also with silicate. Silicon dioxide, which is a much lower availability, change um, your pH anywhere near as much. Um, and also, you know, had had halfway decent luck with that. Um, but uh, but I think your microphone's dropping out again, Stevie. Yeah, your microphone dropped again. Steven. He's, is he gone? Oh, thank God. It took him long enough to leave. I've been waiting. <laughs> All right, back to the Marty right. show. Mark, yeah. what's going on with you, dude? Oh, uh, I'm just DDoSing Steve, you know, kicking him off the yeah. mic. Uh, so, put him in check. Uh, what's going on with me? Um, I've been working on my indoor, kind of getting that. <laughs> A little more beefed up and uh yeah just sort of grinding away on that i have my little sips box here next to me i'm feeding uh aquaponic water too i don't know if you guys can see that very well or not but uh anyway a little sub irrigated planter i have running there so uh i added it in uh oh, looks like steve's back yay steve 
Uh, Sorry about that. My, uh, Boo dungeon. this man! And uh, so it just gets fed tank water oh, after I dose uh, from the from the worm bin. Um, then I take water out of the main tank and fill it up here. But honestly, I don't. I don't even have to do it very much. I'm just now starting to get down to where I can see the top of the rocks in the reservoir, and uh, and I think it's been about maybe a week and a half or so since I added water to it. So um, it's probably going to be about once every two weeks. I think that it's going to end up needing water and. Other than that, it's going to be a, um, pretty much hands-off. I haven't I've really done too much to it. So I like it so far. It's a nice way to sort of expand the, you know, um, like if I, you know, doing water changes or, you know, taking stuff out of the, the filters or any of that kind of stuff can end up going into the earth boxes or, you know. Right on, man. So it's pretty cool. Okay. So probably I think makes more of a... I think my internet stabilized. Tell me if it didn't. Uh, yeah, you're you're back. Okay, I don't really know what happened there. I just had a hiccup with the internet. Um, uh, what is the strangest or most difficult plant you guys have grown there at UVI? Mm. Well, <laughs> the most difficult plant. Um, I mean, really, probably tomatoes are the most difficult to get them to fruit because we have so much nitrogen in the system. Um, the strangest plant, I'm not sure it's, I call it strange, but um, we grow the roselle, which uh, is used in hibiscus tea. Um, we call it sorrel down here. It's a red pear, uh, it's a red pod. It's uh, very related to okras. And that's a really good um, crop. Um, another thing that's you know, really popular now are the bitter melons in the cucumber family. They, you know, uh, people looking for natural cures for high blood pressure, uh, they eat this bitter melon. So that's uh, another crop. Once you like target in on special needs people, uh, then you can, um, you know, boost the price up. So locally produced bitter melon is a good crop for us. I just, I just want to clarify, I, when you I, say special needs people, you're talking about people who specifically want a particular plant and right. not somebody with a handicap. Right, yeah. Okay, diet. I was going to say, if you're, if you're ranking up the price for handicapped people, that's pretty messed up. <laughs> no. Special diets. Well, uh, yeah, special diet. People who need special diets. We uh, raise the price for them. I mean, we, we want to grow a crop that that, that they're, that's desirable to, to uh, them as well. So yeah, uh, we, would, we, would, we would grow that. Um, so another, crop I, orders. another crop I grew a while ago was, um, uh, I can't ever th think about it. Um, uh, I'm, it's slipping my mind right now what it is. It's not flax. It, we were growing it for fiber. Um, I want to say sisal, but Anyhow, we were anyhow we were just growing a fiber crop because uh, it was like um, because you can't grow leafy greens in the summertime as well. If you just want to kind of take a break from growing things in your in your system, uh, if you can grow a crop, it's still going to take up the nitrogen waste and do the uh, water treatment that you need to have happen. But you don't really have to care about the quality of the of a a food crop coming out of it so we were growing um growing a fiber crop for that and uh, right on well no i'll know it when i say it. it's um flannel maybe <laughs> anyway if it's, it's uh, anything oh, oh, it's related jute. to uh, oh god jute i'm sorry jute. okay i would have been way off yeah. Okay. And jute's made into rope, and uh, it might have a, a small market for some uh, people who are into natural fibers and knitting and making their own cloth, you know, getting uh, back to the earth, making your own clothing. Uh, so you could grow jute and, um, and basically just, you know, grow it through the summertime or when, a, when you want to take some time down on your regular vegetable crop and... Uh, 
but still have a something in the system because once you get the system started you really don't get to stop it again it takes too long to start it up uh, and get uh, the fish acclimated and, and growing and the bacteria uh, started so um, always keep the system running even if you're not growing a productive crop Yep, I always got to export those nutrients. Yes, mm -hmm. get them out of there. Um, what do you feel is not covered enough in aquaponic teaching or in aquaponic media as far as topics or, you know, particular problems? Probably startup cost. People think they can, can, uh, can do it really cheaply. Uh, they don't want to invest uh, that much money into it. And it's actually a pretty intensive uh, system. You're taking all these unnatural components, you know, fiberglass tanks or line tanks, uh, expensive components, fitting them all together with PVC pipe, uh, making sure the water flows the right direction, uh, just get, you know, getting the design right um, are all real important things. And I think, uh, so you see a lot of <clears throat> systems you know, on the internet that this will work, but they they are not really tested, you know, the really low cost systems and how much effort goes into running a little low cost system with low production versus, uh, you know, putting the, investing the proper amount of money into it if you're going to be commercial and getting the returns that you, that you've been looking for. You know, if you want to quit, if you want to quit your day job, you need to invest. Very true. And uh, something I just want to interject real quick and uh, follow up on. I've been forgetting the whole show because you're talking earlier about how you guys steered away from media beds and you mentioned the gravel. And when I started out, I did uh, what was a three quarter inch gravel, which um, mm -hmm. if you've ever seen videos from Murray Hallam. He kind of uh, talks about and that's where I got the idea. But after about a year, when the beds were getting a little gunked up, and a little bit too much fish waste, um, I tried to make an air spear to blow it off the bottom. Uh, easily like I would with a hydrogen bed, but that gravel, man, I, it was just impossible. Mm -hmm. You have to completely empty out that bed. Basically, if you want to get rid of the excess sludge and waste. So yeah, um, for anybody out there that's going to be doing a kind of media, I would steer away from, and you don't want a headache. Uh, I would actually invest the cash it takes to get the hydrogen media. Uh, it's much easier to work with in the long run. Uh, if you have heavier plants, like uh, fruit trees, you might be trying to do um, in the aquaponic grow bed. I guess you go. I say go with um, the gravel, but get a fil solids filter in there. Because if you're in there to clean some of that out, you're going to just have a headache and a half with the gravel. And every time you harvest a crop, uh, you're leaving roots behind. So really not good for the lettuces and things where you're removing the whole plant every time. You know, no, if you, uh, I always have to reach in there and dig most of them out. I feel like I can leave some of them just because of all the enzymes that are naturally in there and all the composting worms I've got in my media. But yeah, you mm -hmm. got to get as much of that dead material out of there so you don't have an anaerobic zone building up. Yep. And hydrotone is pretty expensive. And that's where things Unfortunately, like... Unfortunately, I know that story way too well. Sorry, Steve, go ahead. I was going to say, that's when things like red worms and especially black worms, you know, your real small worms species uh, come into play to help. You know, they won't solve everything, but they definitely help with that, with that situation. Another thing you can do is use, like, other microbials. Like, for instance, if you have a bed that you want to just clean up, um, you can decouple it from the system. And um, I've spread out, like... Uh, um, EM1 powder, like the, um, is it just a, it's a rice flour, uh, basically, or rice bran, I guess it is, Let's a Bokashi about... brand. that's what I was trying to think of, it's an EM1 Bokashi brand, and so spread all that out and cover it up, and, you know, in a matter of just a few weeks, to the, you know, they'll eat through a lot of the solids, and, uh, and make it a lot easier to clean out. We're going to do a little myth busting later. There was a pretty outrageous post in the aquaponics world this week, and uh, they just had too much bad information for us not to not to reply to. You, Marty's. I laughing. knew you'd bring it up. I knew you had to. Marty's laughing. It's. it's I am laughing. Too. I literally was in tears laughing when I read this originally. It was just like, 
oh god people would actually think this stuff is like real information so you'll never guess the website is from. oh yeah you'll never guess <laughs> no i'll stay out of it then oh no no it's high fine. times oh no oh yes yeah it was high time no <laughs> um what do you Talk see as the uh what is the what do you see as the future of the aquaponics industry going forward? You know, in the next couple of years. In the in the near future, it's always it's going to be just um, based on cities and local local uh, production, local markets. Uh, there's just too many people in the world right now that uh, you know. People ask me if uh, is aquaponics going to replace conventional agriculture. And probably not for another hundred years, uh, because there's just too many people right now. The system uh, isn't that isn't. I mean, it's really productive, and it's it's addressing that problem of waste discharge. I think that's probably where it'll come in to more being more impactful, like in a hundred years when we're uh, limited on other nutrients, and uh, we want to reclaim all the we can from uh, waste streams. But right now, uh, conventional agriculture is you know, really what's feeding the world. So we're, I still look at it as you know, high value crops for um, you know, people who really wanna be part of the food supply, understand where their, their food's coming from, but it's not uh, the you know, general public that's gonna be buying aquaponics uh, vegetables. Uh, and paying paying the premium price that we need to to get from uh, from our production because we have we're covering a lot more uh, costs than they do in just conventional field production. What is your opinion on um, a lot of these isolated microbial inoculants? Um, I know Marty and I are both a big fan of stuff like Mammoth P, which are mm -hmm. isolated um, phosphorus. Uh, microbes that work similar to the way the nitrification process works but for phosphorus to help unlock a lot of you know because it's a large percentage of locked up phosphorus in the systems already um it helps make a lot of that more bioavailable what do you think what do you see as the future of those you know, i oh. think that's a way that we can get a lot more um um nutrients out of yeah. these systems without necessarily having to worry about fish health you know yeah and <laughs> mammoth p is now we're creating uh mammoth n and, and mammoth k, k as well yep yeah, uh, those are definitely the ways that things are going to be going um, to to extract those nutrients out of the waste streams and using you know biological methods uh, to do it. But those are you know, uh, yeah, the the impact is uh, getting trying to get all the nutrients out of that waste stream. You know that's why. You see more decoupled systems now because uh, you can increase your production uh, with a side stream flow, basically, uh, through another aquaponics, just a straight hydroponic system and uh, pull out more nutrients. So whatever you, whatever you got to, to get that done, uh, those are all definitely uh, on the horizon of what's what's going to be happening in aquaponics. And just for people who are new, would you be able to possibly uh, just explain what a decoupled system is, as opposed to like a regular uh, system with just a sump tank, a fish tank, and a grow bed? Yeah. Well, instead of um, having it all in one system, you might have you have just a, a fish recirculating aquaculture system, which is producing a waste stream, and then you take that waste and um, aerate it, oxidize it, make sure it's stabilized, uh, remove the ammonia waste from it, and then feed that to a uh, straight hydroponic system. So the, the hydroponics system runs by itself and the aquaculture system run by itself. And the source of nutrients is from the, for the hydroponics is from the aquaculture system. Okay, right on. And is there ever really a risk of, uh, since you've got the plants in a separate system from the uh, aquaculture system, from what I'm hearing, is there ever a risk of getting, uh, you know, a nitrogen toxicity uh, before you can no. try and uh, get the water um, cleaned up a little bit for the fish? Uh, I would be, you, you 
treat you treat the water through aeration for it might be a two weeks before you um, move that water into your hydroponic tanks. So no, it would be, it would be that's why I say stabilize the water first. Uh, make sure the ammonia is all oxidized out of it. Right on. And uh, yeah, so I the problem with the decoupled system is you're probably going to be deficient in some nutrients. You're not. You you might have to watch for uh, more opportunities to supplement than in a um, recirculating you know, a, a, a coupled system. Yeah, that's why that's why we do the uh, the dual root zones with it allows us to supplement directly in the, mm -hmm. in the single loop without having any issues. It also gives us a lot more uh, microbial diversity at the root zone, uh, especially we notice for woody crops such as trees or um, some of the other stuff that's uh, blueberries and raspberries. They really do much, and even things like uh, osha root is another good one. Um, there's a couple of medicinal herbs, uh, excuse me, it's escaping me at the top of my head at the moment, but um, that do much better with that. Uh, even a shallow soil layer um, for the mycorrhizal networks uh, that, you know, really help those woodier crops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to keep crops in the system for a really long time because of the uh, sitting in the water, which is an unnatural environment for a lot of them. So they're, they're more open to disease, um, fungal diseases, uh, insects, even underwater, uh, some so keeping them that's you know one of the reasons i focus on those quick crops in and out before they can get sick so once you're looking at a, a long-term crop uh, those blueberries got to be really uh, expensive when you're after you've grown that crop for uh, six months and you're finally getting around to picking a blueberry yeah i try and focus on three month long crops myself okay <laughs> Well, I think I'm going to head out if you have any more questions. Okay. Uh, let's just check yeah. chat real quick. I really appreciate you taking the time to, yeah. to join us. Let's check chat and make sure. Yeah, thanks for all the information. Really, really appreciate it. All right. Anyone else wrote in? Fish guy, you have anything else? Uh, no, this was all great. I learned a lot today. Um, I'm glad I got to stay for more than five minutes for once. Uh, yep. We'll try and make that more of a regular occurrence. <laughs> and thanks again for stopping right. in on the show today, man. Um, I'm sure the viewers got to learn a lot of material. Yeah, I will um, listen into your podcast more often. To become a become a regular. All right, appreciate it. All right, Matt, feel free to join okay. us any time. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Okay, appreciate well, the call. Have a great rest of your day, man. All right, bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.